Thank you, Mr. Nick. Well, it's always my privilege to be able to stand at this pulpit and tell you that I have invited someone that will bring to this pulpit something important for you to hear, and in that will be uh, it'll be delivered in the power of the Holy Spirit. It'll be based on God's Word, uh, and then Dr. Stringer is bringing to us information that many people may not know, maybe new information, uh, maybe information that you've heard in the past and you'll just be refreshed by it. But I think it is important that we understand something, especially in this day and age, about our Baptist heritage. Uh, those of us who are independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptists are so for a reason. And not just because it's a fad, because I can tell you something, it, it wouldn't be a popular fad. And not just because it's something that uh, uh, everybody else is doing, because everybody else isn't doing it. But we believe, uh, I believe, as pastor of this church, this church believes, Dr. Stringer believes, I know Dr. Riker believes, there are those here tonight, I'm certain, that believe the same thing, that this Baptist denomination, Baptist heritage, Baptist beliefs, are based on the truth of Scripture. We believe that, we stand on that, uh, and we need to share that with the world. So many things are happening today in this world that are completely extra-biblical, and I'm talking about in churches. Uh, that's not what we want to do. We want to stay true to our old-time beliefs. And I believe in doing that, of course, we stay true to the old time Bible, the King James Bible, but I'll let Dr. Stringer say some more about that. Would you welcome to the pulpit tonight, my friend, my pastor, Dr. Phil Stringer. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. Hey, it is so good to be here. Pastor Hilleberg, so gracious. I had the chance to preach here every year, and he told me I can keep doing that till I finally get it right. And so I appreciate that kindness on his part so very much. It has been an incredible year for me so far. I haven't had time to take a breath. I left on January the 2nd for three and a half weeks in the Philippines, and it was my 35th trip to the Philippines, and it was just the most incredible time. I'm so thankful for it. I, I try to go August and January of every year. Came back. I was home for two days, and I left for a meeting in northern Indiana and then three meetings in Florida. And then came back from Florida, and two days later, I left for my first trip ever to Israel. And uh, my wife was with me, my only son was with me, my daughter-in-law and my two grandsons. And man, that was an incredible experience, an incredible time. And, and uh, Pastor, we went with our church, and Pastor had told me, he said, you'll preach before the trip is over, but he said, I'm not telling you when. Okay. And he said, you won't need to prepare. And uh, he had me preach at the empty tomb. I didn't know I was preaching until after they'd done the music and the service. But I, I, it was just an incredible, incredible moment in time. I could say so much about it. And then uh, we got back. And I immediately, a day and a half later, I left for a Bible conference in Maryland. And that was Sunday through Wednesday, this last week, and then Thursday and Friday was the annual meeting of the King James Bible Research Council that I helped to start 12 years ago. We, we had an incredible meeting. Uh, we started and started small, as you do with anything, but we had over 200 in the daytime sessions Thursday and Friday and over 400 in the evening sessions, and it, it was just an exciting, exciting time. And then I spent Monday and Tuesday driving back and then spent mo most of Wednesday and Thursday in the college office because it was, my desk was stacked up all over the place. And uh, I have the title at Dayspring Bible College Vice President. I, I don't do what's normally done by a vice president of a college at the title they gave me, but uh, I, I normally do what an academic dean does and involves a lot of paperwork and I can do a lot of it on the road by computer and so forth and I do that every day, but there just some things can't be done that way, and I had a stacked up desk. Pastor called me um, Wednesday afternoon. He said, uh, how would you like to preach tonight? So I preached Wednesday night at Quentin Road and uh, went afternoon and night and all that Thursday trying to, to get the stack on the desk taken care of. And then glory to God, here I am. I get to be at Hope Baptist Church Woo! this weekend. So it's been exciting. In the course of that, I'm not even sure when it was. I think it was in the, after I arrived from the Philippines and before I left on the next trip or somewhere in there, I, I got an email that was just incredible. 
17 years ago, I got to spend a week in Syria preaching. I talk about it all the time. I had nothing, never had anything to match that in my life. And it took me three years to get that visa to go to Israel to preach. Three years, four interviews, more paperwork than I can remember. And then I, I got there and I got in the airport and had to do four more interviews. I mean, it was the most involved, confluted thing you ever imagined. Then they, they gave me a 10-year religious visa. And then the Civil War broke out and I never got to go back. And now Syria is divided into five sections. And one section is ruled over by a Russian general and they have a Russian tank division there. ISIS had come to there and, and the tank division ran ISIS out up in the mountains. ISIS still controls the mountains and the Russian tank division is still there because ISIS would come back down in a minute if they were gone. And God has given that church favor in the eyes of the Russian general. And the Russian general asked if there's anything he could do for them. He's asked it more than once. And they said, well, you know, years ago, we, we had an American preacher come in here and said, we'd sure like to have him come back. And so he issued me a visa before, for, for two years, issued me a visa before I knew it was being discussed. The first of I knew of it was when I got the email with the copy of the visa and the Russian general signature on it that says I can come anytime I want to in the next two years. That was, that was just absolutely incredible. And you want to talk about a surprised person. And my wife can tell you, I, I, I couldn't stop talking about it during supper that night. It just it was an amazing thing. So we're trying to work out the details for that which was exciting, but man, it is good to be here uh, this weekend. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 16 with me. I want to talk tonight about what is a Baptist. And, and then in our times together, we're going to go through the Baptist distinctives in some detail. Amen. This is important because these Bible truths are important. Right. Yep. Okay. And, and, and there's a lot of folks who don't know this. Sitting Baptist churches don't know this. For 10 years, I was down in Florida as the administrator of Landmark Baptist College. It was in the curriculum there that first semester, every student took a course on Baptist heritage. And so when I got there, I began to teach that course. And on the first day of class, the first moment of the first day of class, I'd tell everybody, take out a sheet of paper. Don't have to put your name on it, but you've got to answer this question. What is a Baptist? I said, relax, there's no grade for this. But I said, on the last day of class, I'm going to ask you to take out a sheet of paper. And I'm going to ask you to answer this question. What is a Baptist? And this time your name will be on it. And if you can't answer that question at the end of class, you do not pass or get credit for this class. Okay. And, and these young people came from independent Baptist churches. Virtually no one could give anything of an answer to that question. One girl got it perfect, but her brother had been a freshman there the year before, and so he knew, told her the question was coming and what the answer was. We have not been communicating this to the young people in our churches. Amen. Amen. And we're paying a tremendous price as we see these young people drawn into non-denominational churches that these folks don't know what they left and they don't know what they're getting into. Right. And since they know these truths, to some degree, they don't know that's what being a Baptist is, but they know these truths, they've got them. And they think it just comes out kind of automatic. But then they're raising their children in churches that will not teach these truths. While they, parents may have it, the children won't. And they are just wide open to be raided and led into the most bizarre theological ideas. Because they were not raised on these truths like mom and dad were. Right. And it's a sad thing. It's an unfortunate thing. It is by the, so, so good to see folks I went to college with here. And uh, Brother Kevin and Dr. Riker and, and the Kisslings and all. We, we all went to college together at the same time. Brother Riker was one of the more mature students that laughed at all of us 18-year-old freshmen. And, and I imagine we were fairly 
humorous to laugh at. I've spent so many years around Bible college laughing at 18-year-old freshmen myself, I understand. But uh, it's good, good to see y'all. I'm not sure how much of this I learned when I was in Bible college. At least the definition of it. This is important. And it's important in our day and age that we communicate this, that it's taught in our churches. It needs to be taught by the pastor, but I also think it help, helps if it's taught by a multiplicity of voices. Right. Right. Taught over and over again because this used to be the philosophy, and at the t- there was a time when it was correct, pastor would say, look, nobody but Baptist ever preaches in our pulpit. I never use anything but the King James Bible. My, my folks are safe from being misled. It's not true anymore. Might have been true at one point. Everybody has access to everything on the internet. And we're going to have to go back to teaching basics and teaching them and teaching them and teaching them. It's been proven to us all over the place. What happens if you don't? But what is a Baptist? I believe the beginnings of the Baptist church come up in this chapter. I am not going to tell you it was fully formed. But I believe the beginnings of the Baptist church come up in this chapter. And uh, uh, I have a book out there called Faithful Baptist Witness. I wrote it years ago with this. Uh, it's the thing, probably the thing I'm best known for. Uh, not only here, it's been translated in a number of other languages. It's in Russian, it's in Arabic, it's in Spanish, uh, and, and so forth. It's in French. And the concept behind this, there are a lot of wonderful Baptist history books that are a thousand pages in length and were written aimed at preachers. And they're valuable. I have them. They're wonderful. I just had the idea that most of the people sitting in our pews weren't reading them. And uh, I wanted to tell the story in, in simple terms in such a fashion that the average person could be comfortable reading it. It's, it's almost told in story form. And, and uh, just go, what is a Baptist? What do they believe? What's been the history of people who believe these things? And uh, no way I can cover everything in the sessions we have together, but those books are out there, and they're designed to tell the story. I wrestled for a long time over the name of this. And I almost called it back to the mountains because again and again, Baptists were being persecuted and they would flee up into the mountains. Three or four years ago, I spent time in the jungle between Cambodia and Vietnam with Baptists who went up in the mountains when that, that Cambodian Holocaust came. So, I mean, that's not just an ancient thing, fleeing up in the mountains. They had fled up in the mountains in the 1970s and come back in the late 80s. So it's not an ancient thing, but but I went with this. The faithful Baptist witness. Glory to God, these truths have endured in the fashion they have and influenced many people and are ours today because throughout the centuries there have been people that were faithful to these Bible truths. And not only faithful to teach them, they lived by them. Not only did they teach them and live by them, they communicated them to the next generation so that they had their impact on the next generation. And it's our turn now. And very frankly, very candidly, we virtually lost a generation of young people that did not know these truths. Can't change that now. But our churches are not dead, they're not gone. We've got a responsibility to communicate it to the next generation. And, And I'm sorrowful for the generation we lost. I do not know how to get them back. But, but I, I have something to say about what, why, how we keep that from happening to the next generation. Well, we're in Matthew chapter 16. It is the beginning of a brand new concept. The church. Okay. The church, the word church means assembly. And there is one place in the Bible that talks about the church in the wilderness. Israel was assembled in the wilderness. It was not a New Testament church. The New Testament church was unknown. It was not prophesied in the Old Testament. It wasn't taught in the Old Testament. There was nothing like it in the Old Testament. We will talk about that more in in a later session. And now Christ is going to introduce the concept. 
And I believe in a real sense the church started here even though it was not fully formed here. Uh, I'll tell you up front, uh, there's a lot of debate among good Baptists. When did it actually start? And uh, folks will debate several points, maybe the day of Pentecost and all that. I don't believe it was fully formed until the day of Pentecost, but you can start before you're fully formed. That's right. And I think it was started here. And the reason I think it was started here, two chapters later, the Lord is teaching them how to do church discipline. You do not need church discipline if you don't have a church. So I believe it starts here. And, and he's introducing it to them. And we pick up Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He saith to them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter. And, and some folks get it confused and very unnecessarily at this point. The word Peter comes from a Greek word that means little rock. It could be used to refer to pebbles. We could use it in our day to refer to gravel. Thou art Peter. And upon this rock. The this rock is a different word. It refers to boulders. Kind of the definition was boulders too big to be moved by human beings. Peter was a little rock. But now Jesus is talking about the big rock. And, and when he did... He was tying in to a host of Old Testament prophecies. The stone of something, the rock of offense. What we're told again and again about the rock. Yes. And they saying, he's that rock. Peter's the little rock. The pebble, if you will. That Peter, little rock, and upon this big rock, he's talking about himself, I will build my church, my assembly. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And let me say, before we answer this question, what is a Baptist? A lot of folks are Baptist because they were born into a family that was in a Baptist church. Or because they were saved in a Baptist church. Neither of those things is true about me. Okay? I, I grew up here in Indianapolis. I was reached as a bus kid here in Indianapolis over on the east side by an outfit called the Missionary Free Christian Church. It was a little denomination. It was never large. I was a bus kid. I was reached for Christ there. I got saved there and, and, and was there, involved there faithfully till age 15. At age 15, the bishop of the denomination discovered that the pastor of that church, particular church was teaching salvation by faith. That was not the official, legal, written doctrine of that denomination. And so when the pastor was preaching that, he fired the pastor for it. And I came into church one Sunday morning on the bus. I'm, age, I'm 15 years old. And they read a letter from the bishop. He's firing the pastor for teaching salvation by faith, false doctrine of eternal security, all that kind of thing. I'm stunned. You have to understand, I'm a 15-year-old bus kid. I didn't know the difference from one church to another. I'd been in one church in my entire life. I didn't know what a bishop was. I didn't know what a denomination was. I didn't know any of those things. I understood salvation by faith. And I knew the preacher that had preached that. And I had got that from him. And I'd gotten saved under his preaching. And he'd personally led my father to Christ. And I knew that. But I didn't know any of these other things. That, that was completely beyond me and, and I was stunned and I wasn't happy I came back to church Sunday night and they always had the teenage boys take up the offering and I, they've got I'm taking up the offering that night and they made the fatal mistake of calling on me to pray over the offering first church fuss I was ever involved in brother Riker 
I was 15. They asked me to pray. I prayed, you know, Lord, bless the offering, bless the gift, bless the giver. And I started thanking God for everything we had in Christ and eternal security and salvation by faith and everything my little 15-year-old bus kid heart knew. Wednesday night, their midweek was on Thursday night, they sent a deacon out to see me and explained to me that wasn't the doctrine of the Bible. And it didn't work. I could say a lot more about that, except to say by the time he left, I knew I wasn't going back there anymore. And so I called the previous pastor under whose ministry I was saved. I said, what do I do? He said, look for an independent Baptist church. There's the independent Baptist church had a bus route on that block. That was in the days when there were independent Baptist bus routes on every block. Easiest bus rider they ever got. I sat on my porch and watched for them to come by and went out and waved them down and rode their bus. And went to church. Next Saturday on teen visitation, three pretty teenage girls came to my house and visit me and invite me back. And at that moment, I became a Baptist. It may not be a very honorable story, but I'm just telling you, that's what happened. That's exactly that. So, okay, I'm going to the Baptist church. But glory to God, I did learn some things while I was there. But I, I still, I, I felt two years later, uh, after my junior year in high school, I, it was clear to me God called me to preach at Old Camp Brian, and I'd been going there since I was a little boy. And uh, uh, th then I had to figure out something. Where am I going to go to get trained? Had a lot of friends that were Christians from different churches that were going to a non-denominational Christian university. But that didn't make a lot of sense to me. I wasn't, I wasn't sure what to do. And I was working in a public library. And I, I went in the library and I got to look. And there was a little book by a fellow named Frank Bede called The Handbook of the Denominations. There was two pages in there about every two pages on what Nazarenes believe, two pages on what Pentecostals believe, two pages on what Catholics believe, two pages on everything. And there are two pages on what Baptists believe. So he explained Baptists historically have believed a set of doctrines known as the Baptist distinctives. And, and he outlined them. Uh, Soul authority scripture. I thought, man, that would have been nice at the previous church if they'd appealed to the Bible instead of denominational headquarters. Independent churches. Well, that makes sense. No bishop out there telling you what to do. A saved church membership. Priesthood of believers. Believers' baptism and Lord's Supper as two ordinances. Separation of church and state. And I got to looking at all that. I said, you know, that makes sense. I understood it made sense in practice before I realized how biblical it was. I just sounded like it makes sense. That trauma we would went through would never have happened had it been an independent Baptist church. I mean, I've learned enough. Independent Baptists have their own ways of having trauma, but we would never have had a bishop to, to give us orders or fire our pastor. And so I said, I need to go to a Baptist college. That is where that came from. And it so happened that the youth camp that I went to in the summers, that attached to that same church, was a Baptist college. So that's why I went to Indiana Baptist College and why I got a start on some of this truth. But as you went through those things and you begin, I know it's not all fully developed yet, but it's being introduced. This starts out and Peter's being praised because he got the right answer as to who Christ was. But where did he get it from? He said, you got that from heaven. He didn't get it from men. Divine revelation was the only authority that Peter was appealing to. Glory to God. We have an authority and it is the book. We are bound by a book. We live by a book. In this day and age when folks want to debate so that it's not relevant. And I was listening to one of the famous singers the other day. And she's saying, well, she's a Christian, but she's not bound by, by the old Bible. Okay. So I don't know what she is bound by. 
But we've got to be relevant. We've got to be relevant. No, we're bound by a book. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all of this has been reinforced for me by teaching it at college level over the years. But man, was it reinforced for me well, as I pastored in Chicago. All kinds of people visited our church. They didn't have the faintest idea what a Baptist was. We were blessed to have a number of them saved. When they got saved, they had no idea what was going on. I had to point to them. And they'd ask questions. We had one lady, dear Hungarian lady. And um, she got saved. And she came back the next week and brought her neighbor. And she brought her up to me and said, Father, I told her you give the best mass in Chicago. (laughs) You'd be surprised how many folks called me father for a while after they first got saved. I had to explain this. Over and over and over again in very practical terms to people saved out of Catholic background, Orthodox background, Muslim background, Hindus, Buddhists. None of this was something they knew anything about. The idea that we're bound by a book was brand new to them. That we had an authority. And I I would say that's brand new, frankly, to a lot of Christians. You hear a lot of discussion, some of them mean well, by Christians who want to call the Bible our final authority. The idea of it being the final authority implies there's another one. And there isn't. It's not just the most important of a set of authorities or the last authority. It is our only authority. Divine revelation is the only source of doctrine. I have had since I was all with you last. Interesting moment. I, I, several years ago, a Bible college in North Carolina asked if I would come as a visiting professor. They asked if I'd develop a class. They weren't familiar with any college having a whole class, but the class would be entitled The Dangers of Calvinism. And I would teach, they wanted me to teach 20 hours. So I went and taught 20 hours there and uh, I, I go to a couple colleges in the Philippines every year. And this last August, one of the colleges in the Philippines, they heard me say I taught that class. They said, would you teach that here? Man, I got an education. Not, not, the, the college students were wonderful. But man, there was such interest in that. We announced we're going to have this class that we're expecting 40. That, that's how many students they normally have. Other colleges began to ask if they could come and be part of it. We ended up with 275 students in an auditorium that would seat 260. I mean, it's just exciting. Having that many young people together, you know, was exciting. But I, I was a little surprised. It's right coming off the pandemic, and I'm teaching, and they've all got their cell phones out. Not because they're goofing off during class. Because they're posting it on social media. They're, they're taking pictures of my notes. They're, they're taking snippets of my talking on this, that, or the other. And they're posting it on all kinds of social media. Within 24 hours, this class had gone all over the world. And I'm getting feedback from all over the world. 90% of it positive. Some real exceptions. And this was among those that were critical. And this continued on through the four days. And by the way, it went on and on and on. It hasn't stopped yet. It went on and on and on and on. And uh, I, I hear every day. And uh, we only had a copy of it that was recorded on cell phone. But they went ahead and posted the notes because there's so many requests. And the course on the internet. And people have been watching it and watching it. We're, we're going to teach it. At, at Day Spring, where I'm the vice president in April, and record, we've got the professional recording equipment. All that. We'll get a better copy of it, and we're going to make it available to any college that wants it. But um, I got invited to teach all over the world on the dangers of Calvinism, everywhere from Bermuda to Pakistan. And um, I will be going in August, Lord willing, to the Philippines and teaching it again. I taught it again in January, another place in the Philippines, another college I'm going to teach it. And then I'm going to go... Um, uh, teach the college I normally go to on a sub, different subject. Then I'm teaching it at a college in Australia. Then I'm teaching at a college in New Zealand. I'll be gone for a month. And uh, it just the response has been absolutely incredible. But among those that were, that were critical of it, here's the number one criticism. Far and away, well, who are you to address this? Great learned scholarly men 
believe this is right? Who are you? And, and frankly, I sort of got tickled at that. What I was doing in a class, I always let the Calvinists speak for themselves, and so I'm quoting famous Calvinists, sometimes John Calvin himself, other people. And, and uh, one fella said, well, who are you? R.C. Sproul. He said, you are not as intelligent as R.C. Sproul. You can't possibly disagree with him. J just so happened he was the Calvinist I had in the next set of notes. And, and so I, I began that day, it's being broadcast everywhere, I would begin, I said, R.C. Sproul, who by the way is much more intelligent than I am, said this. But, but I had a theme that went all through the class. It said, all doctrine has to be based on plain, clear statements of Scripture. No doctrine can be based on what somebody thinks is logical. Or what somebody thinks it should be. Yep. Yep. And, and they'll use this argument over and over again. We had a whole day on it. They'll say, if God is sovereign, he must have done it this way. And I'm telling you, if God is sovereign, you and I don't tell him how he must have done it. He tells us how he did it. Yep. That's the end of the story. Yeah. Yeah. First thing, soul authority scripture. Peter's being praised because he got his doctrine from divine revelation not from any of the teachings of the group of men around him right. starts there he said I, I say also to thee thou art little rock and upon this big rock i will build my church y'all ready you want to know whose church it is so I've seen this argument over and over again. So, well, who does that church belong to? Does it belong to the deacons? Does it belong to the congregation? Does it belong to the pastor? It's Christ's church. Yep. He said, I'll build my assembly. The word church was an everyday, ordinary word in the Greek language that meant assembly. They used it to describe the people assembled for an athletic event, the people assembled for political speech. But here's the thing that made this different. He said, it's my church. It's my assembly. It assembles for me. It belongs to me. That is where the concept of the independent church comes from. It's independent of men and human control. It belongs to Christ. By the way, pastors and deacons and congregations all have a role to play in carrying out God's plan. Right. Now, all going to answer to God for what we did with his church. And if any time any of us begin to think it was our church, we're going to answer for that because it wasn't. It's his. Yes. And he said, on this boulder, big rock, I will build my assembly. It's built on Christ. Yep. The rock who's referred to all the way through scripture in dozens of allusions. It's built on him. It's a glory. There's our independent church. It says, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. By the way, that implies the gates of hell will try right. to prevail against it. They'll fail. Yep. So wait, wait a minute. What in the world are the gates of hell? It's real simple. Gates of hell are something you go through to go to hell. It's any religious institution that teaches any gospel other than the gospel of faith. Right. Yep. In Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It's religious organizations are the gates of hell. Yes. And throughout Baptist history, there has been endless persecution of people that believe these truths by other religious organizations. You say, well, sometimes they're persecuted by governments, and that's true, but those governments, for the most part, are being run by religious organizations. I got to be in Vietnam twice. First time I went in Vietnam, it was the border there with Cambodia. I mentioned it earlier. And we were out in the jungle and nobody knew we were there, what was going on. Other time, the time I went to Vietnam as a tourist. But for the purpose of teaching in some underground Baptist churches there, and we were sent to teach Baptist history. 
And uh, we had a tremendous time. But we're, you know, they said, well, here's, here's the hotel you're staying in. I said, here's what we want you to do. I said, you come out, take a taxi. And you take a taxi to this mall. This mall caters to Westerners. Walk around the mall. If nobody says anything to you, then you take a taxi to this fire station. And if you don't see anything out of the ordinary, you take a taxi from that fire station to this hotel in downtown Saigon. So when you get to the hotel, you want to go down the left wing of the hotel. Turns out the left wing of the hotel caters to that which is illegal. And the left wing of the, ho- wing, left wing of the hotel, there was a brothel, there was an opium den, there was a Seventh-day Adventist religious class, and a Baptist religious class. What those four institutions all had in common is that they were illegal. I said, that, that's some way to function. And then they said... If someone says scatter, do not stop, do not ask questions, do not think about it. If somebody says scatter, I want you to go six blocks west and three blocks north and wait on that corner. And, and I don't know if that was actually the right directions. And I'm thinking about it. I said, man, what if I get that wrong? I, I go to the wrong corner. And I'm standing on a corner in Saigon. And I don't know where I'm at. And nobody knows where I'm at. Fortunately, nobody said scatter. They were explaining this to me. They said, normally, the communist government doesn't bother them unless they get a complaint from one of the two legal religious groups, the Buddhists or the Catholics. They said, but if the Buddhist priest calls and complains or the Catholic priest calls and complains, then the government will start looking for them. And I said, why do they complain? And he said, well, that's real simple. Somebody gets saved. And they quit tithing to the Catholic Church. Or they get saved and they quit going to the Buddhist temple and paying for all the ceremonies. So that as soon as it affects their financial status, they start asking for the government to do something about it. So even though it's the government persecuting, it, it really comes from the gates of hell. Now here's the glory. We're not part of the gates of hell. Amen. You understand that? We're separate from that. I know people have mis-explained separation of church and state, and it scares a lot of folks. What separation of church and state in American legal jargon means, the state is not to give orders or control to the church and control the church. Churches don't give orders to the state or control the state. I'm telling you, that's a precious truth. It doesn't mean the state and the church have to be hostile to each other. It doesn't even mean they can never cooperate. What it means is the state never has authority over the church. Right. And the church never has authority over the state. Right. They're separate. We have independent churches. We don't have authority over each other. Church I'm a member of does not send instructions to Brother Hillenburg and tell him what to do at Hope Baptist. Amen. And Hope Baptist doesn't send instructions to Brother Riker. And Brother Riker doesn't send instructions to Quentin Road. We're all separate. That doesn't mean we're hostile. Doesn't mean we can't work together. It's an issue of control. And the gates of hell cannot order us to stop serving the Lord. And they will try. And we Americans are so spoiled, we don't understand this very well. So that week I spent in Syria... Where those folks were being persecuted every week. I mean, we were going along several times a day dealing with this. And I'm thinking, if, if my friends in the United States did this once, they'd think they were heroes. These folks do this stuff every day as routine Christianity. Three little girls. Found out later they're 10, 11, and 12, but they look smaller. Got in the neighborhood of the church and gotten saved. And they were, we were having church every night. And uh, the little girls, the, the militants would gather outside the church and make noise and yell and scream and had pots and pans and bang. And, and these three little girls would hold hands and walk through all, all those madmen 
outside the church to get to the service. I started to step outside and they said, please don't, you'll make it worse for them. You could see the fear on their faces. But they came anyway. Amen. See, gates of hell don't prevail. Right. That doesn't mean they don't try. That doesn't mean we don't have to live with that. That doesn't mean that doesn't challenge us. It means it doesn't prevail. And glory to God. Amen. By the way, when the Lord formed this first group, these raw folks had been baptized. They been baptized by John the Baptist. In a sense, God uses him to introduce the very first church truth in baptism. I was sitting on an airplane coming back from a meeting in Colorado, and I find myself sitting next to two Bible Presbyterian preachers, well-known national folks, and I recognize them. And I got in a conversation with them. It was a very pleasant conversation with them. I told them, said, I've read your books. So we got talking and told them who I was, what I was doing. One of them looked at me and he said, you're not one of those Baptists that think you go all the way back to John the Baptist, are you? Well, I said, oh, no. I said, well, we think the church was started by John the Presbyterian. And they laughed. They said, there was no John the Presbyterian. So I said, I guess we go back to John the Baptist then. <laughs> Glory to God, this was started with baptized people. This is an important truth. It is an exciting truth. I'll say a lot more about it when we get to the lesson on baptism, but I will tell you this. I watch this over and over again in Chicago. Folks would get saved. They didn't know anything about baptism. You'd explain it to them. For many of them, the concept of baptism was traumatic. And it took them a while. They had to see some baptisms. They had to talk about this. But man, the moment came and they got baptized and they got the answer of a good conscience toward the Lord. The, I loved baptizing. A lot of folks have their assistant pastors baptized. I baptized. I was jealous of baptism. Yeah. I, I baptized because I like to see the look on folks' face. When they came up out of the water, knowing they had done what God commanded. We had a baptism in Israel at the Jordan River. And uh, one of the folks who was being baptized asked if I could be the one that baptized them. And pastor very graciously said yes. And we went out in the Jordan River. And it was cold. Oh, man, was it cold? <laughs> but the look on that person's face when they came up out of the water made me miss pastor. They were. Not only were they folks been baptized, there's a reason for them having been baptized. It, this church, this assembly was composed out of saved people. See, Martin Luther came along, preached the gospel, but he didn't understand much else. And his movement, he came along preaching the gospel, challenging the salvation by works of the Catholic Church. But his movement didn't last as a gospel preaching movement very long. Then a generation, some of the Lutherans are preaching salvation by baptism. Some of the baptism by works. But I, I've read his sermons on salvation by faith. I said, how did they lose it in a generation? Because it was built on the pebble, not the rock. John Wesley and I know some folks would dispute this, but, but I have all 13 volumes of Wesley's journal. Wesley preached salvation by faith. He did not preach all the things attributed to him. At one point in Wesley's journal, he tells this story. See, so he's riding along in a coach, and he's sitting there, one man on one side, one on the other. They don't know John Wesley's sitting between them. And they start arguing over what John Wesley teaches. One thing John Wesley teaches, you know, you can't live in sin anymore. You have to be completely sanctified, lose your old sin nature. In other words, they know you misunderstand what Wesley's teaching completely. And they're arguing back and forth. So finally he said, so I'm quite sure John Wesley does not teach you lose your old sin nature. The guy said, well, how do you know? He said, because I'm John Wesley and I haven't lost mine. That's pretty authoritative. Well, within a generation, 
Methodist church was teaching salvation by works. Now, God used the preaching of Wesley and Whitfield all across England and the colonies. It is, the Great Awakening is one of the greatest revivals in world history. Within a generation, many of the folks in their organizations were preaching salvation by works again. So what happened? Wesley was the pebble, and it was built on Wesley. It wasn't built on the boulder. It was built on the pebble, and it didn't last. I'm thankful for everybody who got saved in, in the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation. I'm thankful for everybody who got saved in, in the Great Awakening. Oh, man, the, those, those movements went into heresy so quickly. It was rapid fire. And it's heartbreaking and it's sad. Because they weren't built on the rock. Glory to God, when this first assembly was started, it was started with people who had been baptized. But the reason they had been baptized is they had been born again first. Yes. Yes. They were saved folks. They did not become members when they were born. This was one of the hardest things for new converts to understand when I was in Chicago. They would get saved, and they'd have little children that weren't able to understand. You couldn't give the gospel to yet, and they'd want those little children to become members of the church. I said, they can't be. They haven't been saved yet. That's a qualification. You have to be saved first. Regeneration church membership. It's not introduced yet. But it will come. There's two ordinances. Baptism by immersion of believers only. And the Lord's Supper. The Old Testament is full of pictures of Bible truth. God knows there's something about the human brain that we need pictures. Those pictures were all fulfilled. But he gave us two pictures. Not nearly as elaborate as the Old Testament pictures, but he gave us two pictures. Baptism by immersion, believers only. Glory to God, there's a reason we baptize folks by immersion. And the Lord's Supper, both pictures of what Jesus Christ's sacrifice did for us. And finally, they weren't introduced yet, but they're coming quickly yet Mark Matthew 16 I puzzled for a good while in verse 19 and how that fit with the rest of this it says I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven some have taken to that so we'll see that the Church is part of salvation. But that can't be true when you read hundreds of verses about what salvation is. But there's a truth there. It has to be. He cannot be salvation by church membership. That verse would end up confusing the second generation of Lutherans really badly. Not because they understood it right, but that, that's where much of their confusion came from. So what happened? The real message there, you know who has a chance to get saved? The folks that we take the gospel to. Again, keys. What are keys to the kingdom of heaven? The understanding of the gospel, Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection for you. Who has the chance to exercise those keys? The person that's heard that message, who decides who hears the message? We do. With who we take it to. The folks we don't take it to are never going to hear it. And the truth of the priesthood of believers is that we answer directly to the Lord. Many churches today have only got half that truth. So we don't have to answer to each other. We answer directly to the Lord. That's true. But we focus on the we don't have to answer to each other part. 
When the other half of that truth is we do answer to the Lord. And he's given us a commission. We'll talk about it later. You can't understand the church without understanding this. He's given us a commission to take the gospel to the world. Who has a chance to get saved? The people that we take that message to. And one day we answer to God. For who we took that message to. You don't answer to me. For who you took the message to. You don't even answer to your pastor. About who you take the message to. But you are going to answer to God. For whether you do your part. In fulfilling the great commission. Why is it you answer to God? Because we're all priests. When, When I first went to Chicago. Right around the corner from the church was a little hole-in-the-wall Chinese restaurant. Chinese lady that was running it uh, went around there. Food was good. It was, I could get there in five minutes. And um, I went in there and got to talking to her. And She had never been around Christianity. She'd never been in a building for any kind of religious service anywhere. She knew what Buddhists were and she'd seen Buddhist temples, but she'd never been in one. Christianity completely didn't register with her. But she's a nice lady, and I'd go over there and eat, and we'd talk. And she would often come and sit with me at the table, and we'd talk. And I tried to explain the gospel to her. And, and a number of folks from our church started going there because the food was good, and it was handy, and all that. And I had a little baby girl born. And uh, she came over to my office at the church. She said, Pastor, I need your help. She said, how much does a prayer cost for my little girl. In, in Buddhism, you pay by the moment. You want a prayer, you pay for a prayer. That was the only thing she knew anything about was Buddhism. So she came over to the Baptist church and asked what a prayer would cost. I said, nothing. I said, you couldn't pay us for it if you tried. And uh, she said, well, I need a priest. And I said, I am a priest. Every born-again saved person is a priest. But I said, if you want me to pray, we'll pray right now. And if you want me to, I'll go to the hospital, and I'll kneel by her bedside and pray. And she did, and I went and knelt by her bedside and prayed, and got to watch that girl grow up over the next 10 years. And eventually the lady got saved, and she got saved, and she put her daughter and her son in our Christian school. And, and her husband, who was Muslim of all things, um, which I tell you, he got saved. He was an interesting man. We were having a missions conference one day, and he called and said, missions conference? These people are concerned about missions? I said, yes. I didn't know if he was going to be angry or what. He said, well, let me take you to a real Muslim restaurant so that all of them can see what a Muslim restaurant's like. Sure. So we all went. Nice education for our missions conference. I explained to her, I said, you get saved, you'd be a priest too. You could go to God directly. And that is what the priesthood of the believer means. I get to go to God directly. I answer to God directly. That frees me from answering to man. But you better not forget, it requires me to answer to God. A Baptist is someone who believes these six basic truths. Throughout the centuries, Baptists have been called by many names. A lot of times, name of a preacher, name of a region, uh, a truth. The Paulicians quoted Paul so much, they called them Paulicians. In England, they were called Bible men because they used the Bible all the time. 1500s, after the invention of the printing press, there were folks preaching these truths in Switzerland, and they called them Anabaptists. They said, you're against baptism. And they said, not Anabaptist, Baptist. And it picked up, and because of the printing press, the story of what happened in Switzerland went all over Europe. And the name stuck. We're not Anabaptist, we're Baptist. And because of the printing press, you reached a point where there was one name for these truths. 
And there's been one name ever since, and I'm quite sure that'll be the name till the end of time. What is a Baptist? A Baptist is someone who believes the Bible is the sole authority for faith and doctrine. Who believes in regenerated church membership, believes in independent autonomous churches, believes in the priesthood of all believers, believes in two ordinances, baptism by immersion of believers only in the Lord's Supper, and believes in the separation of church and state. Those are profoundly practical doctrines. They're incredibly important doctrines. And many folks aren't getting them in the evangelical churches of our day. I didn't say all those folks were unsaved. But they're built on pebbles. And it won't last more than a generation. Glory to God. These truths are precious, important. They're practical. They work when they're applied and they're tried. And they're important to us. They're important for us to know. Important for us to stand for. Important for us to teach in our churches. God bless you all. Let's stand to our feet, please, if you would. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Uh, at the end of each session, we'll give an invitation, an opportunity for us to come, kneel at this altar, and take a moment to surrender ourselves to the Lord in whatever he's moved upon our heart for. I do not know what he's touched your heart about tonight, but let me say something to you. Those of us that have been Baptist our entire lives are watching what is taking place in our society. Uh, and we see what's happening in churches across the country. Uh, we watch many people taking Baptist off the church name. Uh, we watch or take it off their sign. They take it off their name. They take it off their literature. They take it off their letterhead because they no longer want to be Baptist or associated with being a Baptist. I'm proud that I'm a Baptist. I'm proud that I know and understand Baptist distinctives. I'm proud that I know and understand Bible doctrine and can preach it from the Word of God. I'm proud that God has done that for me, not with a pride and arrogance, but with a pride of knowing that I'm a child of God and He blesses me in this Baptist church. Amen. And so for just a moment, maybe you need to come, find a spot here tonight and surrender yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, uh, help me, help me be the best Christian I can be and while I'm being the best Christian, I can be the best Baptist representative I can be. And so I'll give you that opportunity tonight as we have our song this evening, please.